Hi everyone. So nice to see you all. I'm glad to have um, to have you all here. Um, my name is Jonathan Lundqvist. I'm the president of the Swedish section of Reporters Without Borders. Um, we're here, of course, to discuss the developments in uh, Turkey. Uh, the events that's been unfolding in the last couple of weeks have really uh, put the focus uh, on the developments over there, especially when you take into the consideration the, the, uh, the uh, Swedish government and the EU deliberations uh, with the Turkish government. We are here also to discuss a joint project that the Port of our Borders have had with a, a Turkish organization, and that's been specifically um, about media ethics and reporting uh, in Turkish media. We have a problem panel, and we also have a moderator, Thomas Turin. Um, and um, uh, I'm going to let him introduce uh, tonight's subject. This is a EU-funded project. That means that they're quite <laughs> good with papers. Here are actually two participant lists, and I'm going to need you to fill both of these in. Um, so, uh, yeah, take your time during the uh, presentation. Yeah, with that, thank you very much. <laughs> Very welcome to all of you. Um, so we will proceed discussing the situation for media in Turkey, recent development, as uh, you not said, and also uh, ideas of how uh, the journalism sector, the media sector in Turkey, could be strengthened. I mean, what could be done to make the situation better uh, for journalists in Turkey? And uh, with us, we have a panel here from left from your side is Aishigul Basher, who comes from uh, the Optime project in Turkey, uh, here visiting Sweden for that purpose only. And we have Gurkan Östuran, who is a writer for alternative media in Turkey, a researcher, and he is in Sweden right now for a cultural project in Tranos. Uh, as a resident curator, so it's a bit uh, something else there. And then we have uh, Anders Kubjörkman from the uh, culture uh, section of Svenska Dagbladet, uh, and who has also written about both about freedom expression issues and about Turkey for, for many years and followed the development. And we have uh, Kerstin Brunberg, who hardly needs any further introduction. I suppose, uh, general direct, former general director of Swedish Radio and uh, panel expert, is that fair to say? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, before we dig into to all of the difficult issues, uh, we are going to watch a little film with a message from uh, Reporters Without Borders representative in Turkey, Erol Underol. I met him how many days ago? Uh, two, days. On two days ago, I met him uh, at a press conference in Istanbul <coughs> about the arrest uh, of uh, the journalists uh, Jan Dündar and Adam Gül. And I asked him to, to give a special message to, to an audience in Sweden, and this is what he had to say. Unfortunately, Turkish colleagues, Turkish journalists are very, uh, are very uh, separated from uh, each other. Uh, they are working in a very fragmented media landscape, affected closely by political tensions and by the oppression of the government. Uh, journalist arrest, uh, uh, aggression against media employee in the street, uh, accreditation discriminations, or, uh, or all kind of pressure on media magnate are uh, uh, fragilizing the work of the journalist and the rec his recognitions by, by Turkish people. Uh, this kind of remind by international uh, colleagues uh, uh, or international uh, intellectuals or circles uh, can bring a very constructive uh, uh, atmosphere that we need here in Turkey, but we cannot make revive uh, due to these daily uh, political tensions and, and, and uh, aggravated uh, uh, conflict. Uh, 
uh, Kurdish journalists are not safe. Uh, uh, journalists working for uh, pro Gulen uh, Islamic uh, movement are not safe. Four years, uh, secular and uh, socialist uh, journalists are not safe in Turkey. Uh, so uh, we can just say that uh, only journalists supporting the, uh, the, the, the political line of uh, the ruling party are not believe that they are safe and believe that they, they, they won't never be uh, in trouble in the future. There is a lot of uh, things to do. Uh, uh, you will do something for us now, but uh, you will see that uh, the common uh, a relation that we will uh, bring together will help you uh, very much to understand our region and uh, and uh, the the better the the, uh, a, uh, the position of a of a country candidate to European Union. Okay, many interesting issues in, in Arold's uh, little speech here that I hope we will get back to during the panel discussion. Uh, so the end message, as I interpret it, is that he uh, he calls for journalists in Turkey and other countries to engage more with each other, uh, partly to give support to the journalists in Turkey, but also so it gives us a be better chance in other countries to, to understand uh, the situation in Turkey. Uh, and uh, before we dig into to the other issues, uh, we will let um, Ayşegül Bashar from Optima, uh, give us a brief introduction about this, that project, which is how this uh, panel discussion is uh, a part of today. Thank you <coughs> for the introduction. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm here today from Istanbul, coming from Istanbul, uh, to start the first of our uh, two seminars in Sweden, because one was already done in uh, Istanbul uh, back in November 2014. So this is the second one. So I am the project coordinator of this project. Uh, it's, it is an EU granted project and uh, it is supported by Arab Movement and uh, RAC, uh, Reporters Without Borders. So I would like to thank you RAC members, uh, Jonathan and Thomas and Urban. And uh, so uh, today it will be, uh, you know, panel members will be talking about the latest situation in Turkey and how media ethics uh, uh, is becoming more and more important in Turkey. Uh, so we are working with a partner in Sweden because Sweden for us is uh, the best case as a benchmark. So we want to improve things in Turkey in terms of media ethics. Of course there are so many things being done in Turkey in terms of improving ethic, ethical behavior in media. Uh, it is a topic covered by all academicians but uh, the important thing is uh, to make it something applied by journalists, uh, to make it applicable for media owners and journalists, uh, to make it something real in our lives. That's why we are holding uh, seminars and we will be also continuing in 2016 with uh, other seminars in Turkey uh, to improve the situation of media. Um, so th there are basically two object objectives. Uh, so we want to uh, improve freedom of expression uh, and uh, the fundamental rights of uh, citizens uh, to have the right uh, for uh, the reality because there is a lot of uh, manipulation going on in Turkey because of the ownership of media because they're basically after 2001 it's becoming more and more common that uh, the media ownership is uh, from companies to the ruling party so the ratio of ownership of media is very different than other countries, I believe. So that's an issue, and uh, there will be other topics covered by our panel members. So uh, I thank you for, for your coming here today, and I will leave it up to panel members now to discuss the issue. Thank you. Very well. Thank you very much, Aishigul. Uh, I think what we're all wondering here now is the, the situation, uh, what has happened recently. Jan Dündar and Ardem Gül, we heard about their arrests. Uh, we heard that Erol Öndero spoke about different groups of, of journalists. He spoke about Kurdish journalists, he spoke about people from the Gülen movement, the, the media from the Gülen movement. He spoke about secular or, or leftist socialist, I think he said, journalist. Uh, Gülkan Öztürk, how would you describe uh, Jan Dündar and 
are them good? Who are they? And, and generally, who are the journalists who end up having trouble today in Turkey? Basically, any journalist who criticizes the government uh, who faces a risk of uh, initially uh, an investigation and then intimidation, physical violence, death threats, and then presence of uh, violent mob even. Jumhuriyet Daily, which uh, Jan Dündar is the chief ex executive editor of, Jumhuriyet Daily has been surrounded by such crowds for a long time now. Especially uh, starting with uh, Charlie Hebdo in France, Jumhuriyet was the uh, only newspaper in Turkey that printed the Muhammad cartoons in Turkish. And after that, there started a hate campaign against Jumhuriyet. Outside, there was a violent mob waiting to even assault the headquarters. The police that seemed to protect the newspaper later on raided the uh, publication house. And Jan Dündar has been in charge of this newspaper for about a year now. And the day he got appointed as the chief editor, he said that Jumuriet from now is going to be even more critical and even more provocative, so that advances could be made in terms of journalism in the country. <coughs> Rather than waiting for the being granted the right to speak freely, they basically wanted to take uh, the issue at hand and go ahead with uh, saying things that are not wanted to be said. And uh, Erdem Gül is the Ankara representative of Jumhuriyet. Together they have uh, worked on a, a case where uh, they have revealed the, the footage of uh, tracks that belong to the Turkish Secret Service, Turkish National Intelligence Agency. These trucks were going to Syria, and according to the photos that have been printed on Jumhuriyet, they have been uh, connected to ISIS. Later on, this uh, footage has been uh, denied by the government, and they said, you cannot, for, first of all, you cannot write about these topics, secondly, there were no weapons, and third of all, that these, uh, if there were any weapons, these were going to the resistance movement of the Turkmen's in Syria. So, in a way, this was, uh, this was like a confession, even. Later on, uh, Jan Dündar was uh, in charge of uh, the video that was released regarding these tracks. And once the video has been published online, it was showing weapons. And then the government again uh, suggested that, yes, those weapons were being sent as aid to the Turkmen in uh, Syria. And later, in October, I guess, it was President Erdogan who said, I will not let him go easily, he will pay for this uh, very heavy. And he was, of course, talking about Jan Dündar. And Jan Dündar tweeted uh, a few days ago, he said, we are being summoned to prosecutor's office, he wants to question us regarding uh, what has happened with these trucks. Later on in the morning, he goes to the prosecutor's office. Prosecutor sends him to the courthouse, and the courthouse says, we have to imprison you for a, a lifetime. That is basically what happened, but the things developed very quickly. And currently he's in prison, but of course, uh, hearing from other writers and journalists who have been in prison before in Turkey, they generally find it much uh, more convenient to write in prison. Mm -hmm. Some friends of ours uh, who have been to prison as writers or journalists, uh, for example, Raghub Zarakulu and uh, Bushra Ersan, they have both said it was like a writer's uh, asylum that you would go there with your books, you would keep publishing, you would keep writing, and you would keep uh, reading, and this was without distraction almost. <laughs> Of course, this, th this is not to be made fun of. Uh, unfortunately, people are being uh, denied their freedom, uh, many freedoms in that aspect. When you look at it from a more humoristic perspective, perhaps uh, it would seem uh, funny, but at least uh, there is even a possible uh, positive outcome uh, from this imprisonment that they will be much more productive. Thank you very much, Rika. Um, uh, I, I talked to the uh, journalist union TGS when mm -hmm. I talked to, um, 
to Reporters Without Borders, and they told me that there are currently 29 journalists in prison right now. 30, actually. 30? Okay, yes. then there's one more. And they said that to me that 22 of them are, are actually pros uh, sentenced, mm -hmm. the rest are waiting for the, the trial. I mean, it's a pre-trial pre detention, so to say. Pre-trial detentions in Turkey can go up to five years. Mm -hmm. So you can be kept in a prison cell, in even solitary in a cell, for five years, waiting for a trial. And the only thing the government is responsible in saying is that they are still filing the complaint about you. So they do not have to have uh, proper uh, proof that you are criminal. They do not have to have any kind of uh, accusations ready. First, you, uh, you put a person in jail, and then this pre-trial uh, imprisonment becomes the punishment itself. It doesn't matter if uh, the person gets released after five years, but then again, even with the Argonicon trials, President Erdogan had said, if we did not want to release them, the EU could not have forced us. The European Court of Human Rights had said that Turkey must release these uh, people because they have been in prison for five years, and the trial has still been going on. The, the Organic trials was a trial against the, the top militaries, uh, with, with hundreds of top militaries being prosecuted for... And for including some writers as including well. Including some writers for, for uh, attempted coup. Was the, mm. was the, and they were later released. All. Uh, I want to go on to, to Anders Kubjörkman, who has uh, written about, uh, uh, for example, an incident that happened a few years back, uh, Rant Dink, who was killed in Istanbul. I mean, we have, it's not only a threat about being prosecuted, it's, it's a threat of violence against journalists. Can you tell us, like, uh, following Turkey over the years, how would you describe the development? Uh... Well, I would say that uh, Turkish press has been, uh, freedom, of, freedom of expression has been gaining power, had uh, earlier, a few years ago. And, I mean, things like the Kurdish issue, uh, what happened in 1915, what, was it a genocide or not, those touchy subjects have always been uh, hard to write about, but I, a few years ago, I, I, it seemed as if uh, freedom of expression was gaining, and journalists were actually writing about these issues. But now it seems as if these forbidden topics are forbidden again, and even more topics are forbidden. So um, and and uh, so it's 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 a very negative uh, development, and as you say, it's not only. Uh, trials that are threatening journalists, but also, like you said, violence. I mean, people are threatened, people are beaten up by hooligans, uh, and uh, newspapers, TV stations, publisher houses are confiscated by the state. And, and, and of course, people are even murdered, like Ron Tink, and, and I, like this... Um, lawyer uh, in the Arbaka the other day. Mm -hmm. He was shot in the street. By whom? We don't know. But anyway, it's, 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 uh, this is, I would say this is simply not acceptable in a democracy. Uh, the development now is it's, it's turning into something else. Uh, and I saw on Swedish television the other day uh, the show about Turkey, and uh, Bülent Kenesh, I think from Zaman, yeah. the newspaper Zaman, he was interviewed, and during the interview, police came up to him and said, You're, you have parked wrongly. <laughs> and he said, and he accused them of bullying him and following him, and he said, this is, this is more like Egypt, this is not like Turkey. And I, I would say you could also compare this to, to how dissidents were being treated in the Soviet bloc once. So it's a very bad development, mm -hmm. I would say. Kerstin Brunberg, um, as a former general director of Swedish Radio, and, and I'm sure you have been to these kind of panels and discussions over the years many times. I mean, when we have such a serious situation uh, for freedom of expression, what what can Sweden do? What can journalists do? What can the government? Do? What can be done from the outside? <coughs> First of all, I, I think I'm the only one in, in this room who has uh, least experience from Turkey myself. I've been there once only. But I've followed it for quite a long time uh, from Sweden. 
Uh, and um, first of all, I'm I'm very humble to your when you are talking about will you take your time to to discuss media ethics in this situation where we. Yeah. And I think it's so so good to to not to. Uh, to, uh, it's good to keep this subject because it's it's about the journalism which is trusted. Mm -hmm. I also want to say that um, I don't want to talk about media. I will I will talk about journalism because today when you talk about media freedom, well, you have uh, uh, what, what sort of media freedom yeah. do we mean? Commercial media freedom or what? It is all about journalism, and that's what we must focus on. Also, when I've been had the possibility to be in in, in, um, in other other countries with with uh, not democratic countries, I, I, of course, it's also uh, it's it, you come there and and you are full of the system we have in Sweden to pre preach about how good that is. And I think that is a very bad attitude. You must start from another point of view uh, to uh, understand the situation uh, uh, of the journalism and uh, and uh, uh, be be. You can't move the situation uh, we have in Sweden to another country just like that. And you have laws of freedom of expression, for example, but nobody thinks it is a freedom, real freedom of expression. So that, that is said about the law. Now it, it's so much about the citizens and the journalism. And there you must find the situation. And it is also a paradox in situation where, where we really need illuminating the citizens and scrutinizing the power. The, there is such a backfire for journalism and oppressing of, of journalism. And, and, um, uh, sometimes I think it's so, uh, what shall we do? <laughs> but I think one thing is, from the Swedish point of view, is to cover Turkey and to cover these matters. And also to work with this as a journalist when you meet the, pol the Swedish politicians and the politicians within the European Union. You must never forget to put questions about this. Because you must go on all the time, uh, I mean, to, to, to really... Um, uh, ask for for what what are they doing because they have the possibilities to to, uh, to do things uh, and also of course that the Swedish population as a whole uh, <coughs> traveling being globalized uh, must know what is going on that is really uh, and that is also important to make people understand why people are leaving their countries why people are coming from Syria and from you must we must cover what is going on in, in other countries. On the same time, I think business is global. Uh, well, finance is global. People are globalized. Journalists must also work on this global uh, level. We can't be just in our own nations uh, because we are professional and we are doing the same job. We have the same. Uh, idea about what is what quality journalism is about, and uh, that's why it's so important. And also to share, to really share also ideas about what is going to be done. And uh, one thing that I am interested in is how can we have uh, uh, a common project between us on on a matter which is. Uh, uh, maybe discovered or or in in Turkey, and we can go on. We can publish publish things that you can maybe publish, and in that way we can work together. But of course, the the, the question about media ethics today, protecting of source, uh, uh, impartiality. Of course, that is things that we must work together with also. And one thing which is good in in Sweden, and I think that is due to. That we have been, we had had a rather strong history of, of uh, good journalism. Is that the the, the, the question about self-regulation? That's why it's so important <coughs> to discuss these yeah. matters. I'll stop there. Yeah. Thank you. Very much. Um, picking up on what you said about about the the, the good journalism and and. Uh, uh, 
and also going back to something that Errol Önderov also spoke about, that the, the, the Turkish journalists are very fragmented, they are very separated from each other. Uh, so I would like to, to ask Gürkan, maybe I'm going to show you a couple of newspapers, I'm going to ask you to describe them and, and what it says. So here we have newspaper Yeni Akut. Uh, you want me to comment on the headline? Or <coughs> you can describe the, yeah, the yeah, paper please say, itself. Please say that the headline and what kind of newspaper it is. And so the headline says, uh, Demirtas is protecting the murderers of Elchi, Elchi being the human rights activist uh, lawyer who was uh, assassinated in Diyarbakir. And this is a newspaper uh, that represents the Islamist groups uh, in Turkey, it has a uh, selling number of 50,000 uh, on a daily basis. And not very big, but it's... Uh, not very big, but it is one of the most hardcore Islamist papers that uh, even starts hate campaigns about individuals, uh, activists, journalists, etc. And they tend to put people on targets. And their followers, uh, I would say, their readers, would be the ones to take the streets uh, violently. Would you say that, that uh, journalists from this newspaper experience troubles? I wouldn't think so. Yeah. Maybe if they uh, finally run over someone again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we have Jumhuriyet. The usual suspects. Hmm. <laughs> I'm not excited. Oh, yes, that one. Uh, so the headline refers to the EU and Turkey deal. When the money is transferred, uh, the button is pushed, meaning Turkey started, a, uh, Turkey started raids now. They are detaining uh, migrants who are trying to make it to Europe. Migrants and refugees, in fact. Uh, they are detaining these people on the shores of Turkey. But this operation has begun only after the 3 billion euros has been granted by the EU and uh, the chief of uh, constitutional commission from the governing party, he tweeted uh, at 1 a.m. saying, have you seen how we made EU pay for us? We threatened them saying we will open the gates and release all the refugees on you or else uh, you will pay us. And this, type, uh, this headline also is in line with that. You already introduced a bit about newspaper when you spoke about Jan Dündar, the arrested uh editor-in-chief, but could you tell us uh, a bit about the, does a journalist from Jumhuriyet usually have problems with, with the Jumhuriyet form? has a Guinness World Record, unfortunately that is written on a black page. This is the newspaper that has lost the most number of columnists and journalists to assassinations. And they lost the most number of journalists to uh, violent attacks. And they constantly uh, get threatened. Okay, we take this one briefly. <laughs> this used to be founded by uh, an opposition leader uh, in Turkish politics. Then all his property got confiscated and then the newspaper has been sold to one of the crony uh, investors in the country. And currently it has been uh, propagating for the government. And Putin in an anyok means no one believes in Putin showing the flourishing friendship between Turkey and the United States, uh, making readers believe that uh, the US uh, government still supports the Turkish government. So would, would you say, you said that it used to be, uh, have an oppositional stance towards the government and now yeah. is, is pro, would, would you say they have problems with the, the government? Not anymore, uh, but I remember the day when their headquarters got raided and the newspaper was confiscated by the state and then was put on sale. And back then they had fired many journalists who did not agree with this idea. The same thing happened uh, last month with uh, Ipek Koza Group. Now it's, it's one, I don't know if it's fair for you to describe it since you're working for it. but uh, <laughs> Not exactly working for it, I must clarify that I voluntarily write for a lot of media uh, groups. So knowing that Agos would be barely, barely uh, sustaining itself, most of the writers, we dedicate a lot of our time and we try to uh, contribute as much as we can. Uh, of course, there are full-time hired people that are working for these newspapers, but uh, Agos is the most popular Armenian-Turkish uh, newspaper that is published on a weekly basis, but the web version, the digital version, gets updated on a daily basis or even hourly basis. 
and it publishes in Armenian, Turkish, and English. And I write for Agos as well in, uh, with regards to digital rights and liberties. And Agos is subject to a lot of intimidation and threats. And the chief uh, editor, or even the owner of Agos, was Hiran Ding, who was assassinated in 2007. And I remember, I would like to also uh, put a parenthesis there, I remember my first time writing for Agos, I received a very horrible, hateful email. I had written about the, the situation of digital rights and liberties in Turkey, and the email basically said, are you a historian? Why are you talking about these subjects? Why do you even mention Armenian history? And then I asked my editor, what is wrong with this? I didn't write about history, I think. <laughs> are they confusing me? And my editor said, this is a copy-paste comment. Welcome on board. Uh, finally, your readers have accepted you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, this is not a newspaper, but uh, it's a very well-known. Uh, yeah, one of the uh, very well-known, one of the best-selling caricature magazines. Uh, in Turkey, I, I actually would like to also speak about the number of sales, maybe, in this aspect. The best-selling newspaper would be Zama, which sells about uh, a million copies on a daily basis. And then the numbers keep drop, uh, dropping dramatically, and uh, the first newspaper that we saw sells about 50,000. The best-selling media in the country is the caricature magazines, because I think they're independent, they're very direct and they're very political and they're very creative. And also they're entertaining from time to time. And Lemon is one of those uh, uh, media organizations. And can you uh, make a guess how much uh, how they have sell? I have no idea. Not Lemon, but uh, an average uh, caricature magazine. The best selling one is six million. And then the numbers. Yeah. On a weekly basis. Which one is that? Uykusuz, I think. Uykusuz, Penguin, Leman, Gurgur. All these uh, medias, they are the ones that sell the best. They penetrate into all parts of the society. And uh, I would say each copy would be read at least by 10, 20 people even. And are so they are, pardon? Are they intimidated as well? Constantly. Yeah. <laughs> they, they get threatened from time to time, but uh, Penguin was maybe the first uh, first media organization that got threatened by Erdogan personally. They had thrown uh, a cover page, not Penguin actually, it was Jumhuriyet, the caricaturist from Jumhuriyet had drawn Erdogan as a, a cat and Penguin took this as a cause. They drew him as uh, different animals and he had taken the uh, paper to court and they had to pay a fine uh, in return for drawing him as an animal. Uh, this was a case where the, back then he was the Prime Minister and they, uh, the case was that this was insult to the Prime Minister's persona. And they uh, initially made the payment and then they kept publishing and printing and they started selling the posters. So in a lot of houses and cafes you can, uh, you can now see huge posters of that uh, cover page. So I think the media organization has uh, even covered the money for that. <laughs> How is it possible for them to go on? Why? Are it, it is because they are popular or...? or uh... They do not take advertisements. They only rely on sales and uh, special events such as uh, book, uh, book signing. They constantly produce. On a weekly basis they uh, print these uh, uh, magazines and then they participate uh, in a lot of events. So financially they are not very fragile. Which means they can, they are self-sufficient and... And they can pay, pay fines. They can. Mm -hmm. and, and there is a huge readers group behind them. Yes. And Jumhuriyet, for example, no matter how high quality journalism they uh, have been doing, they can never, I think, they can never imagine even those numbers, six million. Mm -hmm. Any newspaper in Turkey, they cannot even dream of such numbers. But uh, the caricature, caricature magazines, they can, and they do, and they can sell even more. The reading habits, we talked earlier about uh, the reading habits in Turkey. N the percentage of regular readers in Turkey is very low. Turkey is a very visual country that doesn't really focus on reading so much. 
So regular reader means uh, dedicating at least 45 minutes of one's time on a daily basis for reading uh, leisure, uh, uh, leisure reading. And that 45 minutes is only dedicated by 1 in 10,000 in Turkey. That average is 38% in Sweden. So the comparison can be made. Yes. But this is a great progress for Turkey because five years ago the number was 1 in 50,000. So we are catching up very slowly, but we are catching up. Right now we have five times more readers in the country. And in about 200 years' time, I think... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Rika. Uh, so we have a little demonstration here of the kind of differences, some of the differences. Uh, what would you say, Anders? How, how is it possible for a media landscape this fragmented in Turkey to, to unite? Is there, can they find any common ground? Uh, well, I guess when they're under threat, sooner or later they might have to. Uh, but we were talking about the Swedish self-regulating press ethical system. Uh, I think it has served Sweden very well, and it, since it's stretchable, I mean, Svenska Dagbladet and uh, Tabloid Expressen will not always make the same uh, decisions, and but it's allowed within within the, within the system. And since we take these different uh, decisions, and since since the system is stretchable, there's always a vivid discussion about press ethics. So I think. It is also a very good guarantee for, for us not having politicians uh, uh, pestering us or writing laws saying you can't publish this, you can't print this. If we behave reasonably within the system, they will let us be. And so I know you can't implement this on Turkey tomorrow, but uh, in the long run, I think it's, it's, it's a very good system and it could probably uh, serve in Turkey too, hopefully. Uh, and then if, if it is stretchable like this, it, it would be possible for journalists from all over the place to, to discuss within the system. But I guess Turkey is so polarized and, and I mean, um, for me it's even hard sometimes I, I'm sure you, you two know this, but who is, who is the good guy and who is the bad guy? Which Islamist is worse than the other? Is any one of them good? I don't know. But, but so, so it's so polarized, so maybe it, I know tomorrow it's hard to, to, to get the, the people together in the, in, the, in the system like this. And also, I guess, uh, the government wouldn't want it. Do you like to add something, Fisher? Yes, uh, I, I, just to understand what saying, I think, the, to have a self-regulation, you need collaboration. And, uh, uh, and also when you, it comes to media ethics, it's also necessary to discuss, not to be uh, in consensus every time. You, mu you must have, dif as you say, you must have different opinions within the system of self-regulation. And that's why I think it's, it's useful uh, to, to make this uh, as the best thing to pick up from Sweden, maybe, the self-regulation system, I think. Mm -hmm. Because you can, the more you work together, the stronger you will be, uh, mm -hmm. even if you, uh, even if it is about discussing, not being, uh, having a consensus, but discussing. Uh, I think that is important. With a system of a press ombudsman, like we have, Erdogan could go complain to him instead of prosecuting people. Can I ask you this question concerning the, the technique here? I mean, if, if Erdogan wants to confiscate, or the government wants to confiscate the paper, does it go to court of law, or is it like being confiscated just by a political decision? Uh, how to explain Kayum now? The, the Kayum. That's, uh, the, the state, I think, the, the court says that the state have right to decide for a person to, to be a, a care holder. Of yes, so. but uh, in the in the most Ooh, recent case, <laughs> in the most recent case, uh, it happened like this: the government decided and declared that there is going to be a care uh, caretaker 
for uh, a media holding for two newspapers and two TV stations. Mm -hmm. And then the caretakers have been uh, appointed, both members of uh, the governing party and active members, so they were supposed to be independent to begin with, not even seemingly they were active uh, mem members of the party, and then they apply to court to get the court order. So the court order is just a formality. Mm -hmm. do, they just the, do they get the control of the assets as well? Yes, or? and any journalist, any member of these institutions who said, why were we uh, taken over? They take the names, they ask which department they work, and they say, when you're leaving, clear your desk. So they were fired immediately. They cannot appeal to a higher instance. They can. They can appeal to courts, and the, this will probably not result in anything in the next seven, eight years. We recently, just two days ago, uh, there has been a case when uh, European Court of Human Rights has uh, finally decided that Turkey's ban on YouTube was wrong. Mm. And how many mm. years has it been? YouTube has been banned. It's slow. <laughs> It takes, so it takes two. The Russian scenario. She it's going to be the same as in Russia. The punishment comes before the court case, so it takes uh, already a long time. Even if uh, the court decides that uh, this was unjust, the punishment has already been taken. I want to pick up on something that Cestin uh, and uh, Anders were speaking about the self-regulation in Sweden, where we have this the. the the media itself, so to say, regulates journalists if they violate ethical issues, so to say. Can you describe a bit how it works in Turkey today? Is there, can, can the media audience go and say this is crossing the lines, for example? I can't remember exactly what topic it was, but uh, President Erdogan had summoned all uh, chief editors of newspapers and all executives of the TV stations. I think that was after Roboski bombardment, to tell them you are not allowed to speak about this. You are not to bring this to media attention. And then the pro-government journalists, they have declared, we should have done this long ago. We should have been self-regulating. We should have been putting pressure on the critical media to shut up about criticizing the government and be more uh, proactive regarding the government policies to serve as PR agencies, basically. So that could have been the case in the Turkish one because we have such an imbalance in terms of media ownership. So any self-regulation within the uh, field currently would result in absolute censorship of uh, all the critical media. But there are some initiatives which are really uh, promising, I think, for the future. The Turkish Journalists' Union, this has recently been founded, recently meaning in the past couple of years. And I believe their course will uh, eventually lead to something much more progressive in terms of journalism in the country. At the moment they are trying to bring in people of different uh, values, different understandings, different backgrounds, different way of life to uh, the same table. They are trying to make them interact. They are trying to bring in independent journalists, uh, alternative journalists, Islamist ones, social democrats, etc. All of them to at least discuss the basic principles which all of them would want to agree on. And they are trying to initiate solidarity among the journalists. But the solidarity, I think, exists the most among the citizen journalists and digital journalists. At the moment, there, are, there is so much pressure on established conventional media that in every corner there is a digital platform that is flourishing. We have been so stripped of our news sources that the most trustable news comes from your friend. Currently, out of my, uh, off the top of my head, I can remember at least four friends of mine who have started some in, uh, platforms like that. One is the the others post, Otekilerim postası, then Dokusek is citizen journalism uh, platform, and then there is the 140 journals, and then voluntary journalists network and three of those four have been uh, taking SIDA funding in fact so we are very grateful for that <laughs> we can discuss more about the citizens journalism and our social media uh, things a bit later but I want to, to pick up on something that you mentioned of the, of the 
the initiatives for a common ground, for kind of some kind of journalist principles that all journalists in Turkey could agree upon. If you were to be on a meeting like that, uh, Anders and Shastin, what, uh, speaking of the Swedish experience, what, what would you advise them? What, what kind of common ground can journalists who have very different worldview and political ideas, um, what would you advise them to, to formulate that, that common ground? Well, um, I, I think um, uh, the importance of, of, of scrutinizing the power uh, to discuss uh, ways of doing that would be the most important from my point of view. Uh, because I think that is, that is why we are here. That's the most important reasons for, for why we are journalists and why, why you have need journalists. The, the other thing is, is as you mentioned, uh, if I may take, talk about that now, is the cooperation with, the, with the citizens' journalism in a good way to have an exchange. Because in that way also you uh, will make you more usable, more trusted, I, I think, about, uh, among citizens. Because you need that support, you need, you, need, you need to be demanded. I can see that there is a bigger demand now for qualified journalism because people need that. And I think that is one more discussion to, to, to really help each other to do journalism in depth. And, and together with all the knowledge you have from citizen journalism. One thing I th might be a problem is also to have the the line, good line between um, activism and journalism. Uh, it goes together sometimes, but you must also have um, an activist-driven uh, journalism as one sort of journalism, and the other journalism as a, one, another sort of journalism. But the plurality, is, I think, it's so important. That was one of the accusations by the government in Turkey that these are not journalists, these are activists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily very separate from each other, but of course... That depends on what you are uh, activist in, because my experience is from uh, the Democratic Voice of Burma, who, who was uh, publishing things from, from Norway and from Thailand, and they were from the very beginning activists, uh, but learned a lot of, of uh, professional journalism, and mm -hmm. they had good things with them, which they put together with the, with the, uh, the professionalism of the journalism, and that, that has been very effective. Very interesting. Well, I, often when I speak to, to government officials or AKP uh, members uh, and bring up the, the issue of freedom of speech, I often hear that answer, which is kind of what we're into at the end, and they say that the, a lot of the people who end up having trouble in Turkey is not because they're journalists, but because they are, are, are doing criminal things, and, and they're also saying that they're crossing the line, so what journalism should be exactly this kind of, like, they're, they are more activists than journalists, they're not sticking to the rules, so to say, it's kind of the argument that they, they often provide. Uh, what, what would you say about this, uh, Anders, about the... What could be the common ground? Is it, you said before that you think it might be difficult. It, it seems very difficult when, when I hear Gurkan saying that, that the, the pro-government uh, journalists or editors were saying we should have been doing this, censoring ourselves more earlier and scrutinizing the, the, the critical media. So it seems as if there, there is hardly any common ground. Uh, I mean, the, the, it's like what Shastin says, our, our, what we're here for is to scrutinize power. And, and if, you, if you do the opposite, then you're a public relations manager or, 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 something, or a propaganda machine or something like that. So it seems as if it's very difficult. Maybe, maybe the educational system for journalists, I don't know too much about that though. Uh, like the, the media, the, the government, pro-government media, are the journalists educated journalists or...? Uh, there is a good many people who are graduates of these departments, but in Turkey, these uh, departments who train people to become journalists are called communication faculties, and that department is, is usually called journalism, communications, and public relations. Mm -hmm. so, so it's together. What you learn in these departments would generally be uh, how to handle PR. So maybe that's where you should start then, with the educational system, to, to, to teach journal 
there are very good uh, communications departments also and brilliant professors of journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess uh, their students, unfortunately, are too few compared to the numbers in Turkey. Every year, if we have 100 people graduating and they have to start from scratch and they have to climb up the ladders uh, very slowly and most of them, they will be pushed outside of the circles and they will become marginalized and they will uh, turn towards alternative media where only 50,000 people in total will hear them. Mm -hmm. But, as I was saying earlier, I'm uh, optimistic in that sense that these numbers are growing with quality writing, with quality journalism. I think the number of uh, quality journalism readers is also growing. So, in that aspect, I believe if we go back to the original numbers of the publications, uh, sooner or later, uh, the caricature magazines will take over media yes. and journalism. <laughs> Currently, there are actually some of them that have initiated the process or, of becoming more like a newspaper. They have the caricatures in half of the magazine, and in the other half, they actually have columns for journalists that are very good, very critical of uh, everything in the society. They uh, proactively uh, suggest policies even. So in that aspect, with the quality, uh, quality writers making more of an appearance, I believe in the future there will be a change. Thank you. Okay, I think that, uh, I must say that also in Sweden we have a problem with the PR, uh, which is, flow uh, I mean, that's more and more people working with us, and also the, the blurring between PR and journalism we have in Sweden. I mean, this is an important case to talk about even here, uh, from my point of view, and, and uh, uh, brand with all the different uh, type of so-called, so-mentioned journalism, I mean, brand, uh, branded journalism, for example. But I think that um, that uh, uh, I still think that self-regulation and, and or a common discussion about uh, the quality in journalism is, is is a common subject that where, which you can talk about, and also the need for for informed commentaries and, and insightful analysis is is what people really really ask, ask for. One thing that I'm thinking about a lot is like we, we speak often about the relation between journalism and democracy. Uh, so, I mean, is it when we speak about, uh, for example, the, like, the last EU report on Turkey, it says that Turkey is seriously backsliding on, on, on pressure freedom issues. So how, I mean, could you actually say that Turkey is a democracy anyway? I mean, if, where is the relation, would you say, unders maybe? Like, well, it, it, it is, I would say it is a democracy, uh, but, but uh, it is a democracy with huge problems and, and with a ruling party that does not want to lose power at any rate, uh, any, in, uh, yeah, at any rate. Uh, and, uh, and it does not respect freedom of expression. And I would say that freedom of expression is one of the main uh, components of a democracy. So that's, that's they still have elections, and, and, and I, I think uh, the voters are respected as far as I know, uh, but, but um, this, this development with freedom of expression is, is really hurting the Turkish democracy. I mean, it has, a history with the military coups, and the military has been uh, had their uh, their sort of been been controlling the country. Uh, I don't think it's really the case now, although it's swift, slowly drifting towards towards the military again. Uh, but but today it's the AKP that has this control. Uh, and it's it's a, it's a big shame. And I, I was thinking also maybe what could be done is that the EU could put pressure on Turkey. They did that earlier, and things really happened, I think. And then suddenly, uh, everyone realized that EU would not make a Turkey a member, and and we have the euro crisis, and and now we have the refugee crisis. And suddenly, it's, a, it's Turkey putting pressure on EU instead. Mm -hmm. 
So now we have the situation where EU does not even want to say anything criticizing about Turkey. So, at least it, at this point, EU this cannot push Turkey towards Russia. <laughs> <laughs> Previously, that was a risk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But in terms of uh, military rule, I think I believe there is still progress in in terms of democracy in Turkey. I'm so happy to see that now critical uh, critical groups in Turkey, uh, when they are discontent with the government, they do not keep calling for a military coup to take place. So uh, we are gradually uh, moving forward uh, in that aspect. It's not a military state anymore, it's becoming more like a police state, but at least it's, uh, it still has a civilian face. Mm -hmm. And uh, with this much control over the media, before the elections, uh, the higher institution for uh, televisions and radio, they declare all the minutes of uh, appearance for all parties, and about 95% of all the time has been dedicated to the governing party, and then the 5% gets uh, divided up between all other opposition. And with this kind of control over media, I think it's a big catastrophe for the governing party to only get 50% of the votes. Mm -hmm. They should have got at least 75%. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one important uh, item also for common discussions is the surveillance uh, of of, uh, of journalists and and uh, uh, also methods uh, when it comes to the digital um, way of of exchange um, content. Not so that 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 uh, the 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 work on on a, on on a newspaper and and can be hijacked. Uh, by those who want to to know what you are doing, uh, I think that is a very important subject to discuss. Surveillance is definitely a very very important and risky subject, even. Yes. And uh, I believe when they have a lack of digital tools such as NetClean or Proceda, mm -hmm. they might be employing even people to yes. go ahead and uh, interfere with the hardware very often, it started to become very often that uh, also international journalists living in Turkey get subjected to such break-in attempts or break-ins when they only lose the phone or the computer and the hard disks these things disappearing started to happen more and more often now. Yes, and, and also um, you must have the same knowledge as a hacker to be able to protect your content. And for that uh, aspect, the digital rights and liberties uh, groups in Turkey constantly give trainings to journalists and citizen journalists and everyone who is interested in uh, how to protect uh, personal data, how to uh, encrypt data, how to use internet safely in terms of uh, access, and how to uh, have free access to information. I was thinking of something you mentioned earlier about that you said that the most trusted source of, of news or information is your friends. Yes. That's kind of how, how people perceive it, at least in Turkey. Uh, what happens in a society when there is so much distrust against each other that you don't... I might have showed a few of these newspapers, and I'm sure that if you ask someone in Turkey, they would not read both. You know, They would stick to their side, so to say. I mean, what, what happens in a society like that? How, uh, would you, how would you say that your discussion with people who are not on your side, so to say, how can you communicate with them? Hardly. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately so, because uh, let's assume there are only two sides, and both sides would stick to their facts, to their sources, and to their standpoints, their uh, opinions, very few, very small percentage of the people would be open for discussion and fruitful uh, debate even. We try to organize events where uh, we invite people from all different uh, sides so that they would come and discuss things. But generally, uh, especially one side refuses to take part in these debates. And which is that? Uh, make a guess. <laughs> the same part, uh, the president of which does not uh, appear in uh, political debates before elections in the last 15 years <laughs> and has killed uh, the tradition of political debates before elections. So, uh, in lack of dialogue and uh, discussion, it is very hard to indulge in such atmospheres. But when there is uh, such a case, we present our opinion 
uh, I at least uh, try to speak whatever I have to say and then usually get uh, get the response I don't think that is truthful I think that is uh, just international propaganda of the uh, of the colonist countries etc <laughs> etc et and then very often you get to be declared as a spy of Russia, Iran, China, US, and Kenya at the same time. Kenya. <laughs> Countries may vary, <laughs> but usually in a collaboration. Uh, re recent months, I've, I've been to many uh, journalist uh, initiatives, the ones that you were mentioning before, where, where they try to get journalists from different fields, so to say, the, the Gulen movement journalists, leftist journalists, uh, to come together and try to defend each other when they get violated, for, to at least have, they say openly as well, like, we, we will not have the same worldview, we cannot agree on many things, that's not going to happen. But let's come together when we get uh, jailed or prosecuted or beaten up and say that we stand up for each other and press freedom. They're trying to do that, I think there are initiatives like that now. Uh, but in every of these meetings that I've been to, I've never seen one, of, one journalist from the pro-government side and I've asked the, the organizers many times, why, why don't you invite them? Shouldn't they be here as well? And should you speak about it on the whole society level? And they just look at me and they're like, Thomas, that's not going to happen. That would be, we couldn't organize this. We, there would be fights, fist fights within the room. We cannot discuss this. It's not possible, they say. I don't know. I don't know if it's... Uh, I'm, personally, I have contact with some, some journalists who work for the pro-government, or, or at least... The, 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 the media companies that are owned by, by uh, Milliet, for example, who is a, a newspaper which is uh, pro-government, but it's not owned directly by Erdogan, it's, it's uh, by a businessman who is very favorable to Erdogan. Uh, and I, I can discuss with journalists who work for them, and may, often they are quite open with, uh, on a personal level, but, but then when you go so to say, the representatives of the companies, it seems that they stand very far away. So to say. I think their paycheck might decide on their opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to add something, or should we move on to, to questions? Maybe? Uh, the digital media, I can maybe briefly explain a few little things. So there are uh, quite many uh, platforms in Turkey that are flourishing from every corner. Uh, and these are, uh, as I mentioned earlier, are the most trustable uh, sources that I have. And every now and then I get to be declared as uh, having a very strong opinion against something because I do not write about these topics. And I try to explain myself, and uh, we discussed this earlier with Thomas as well, that the reason why certain uh, articles do not appear uh, in the platforms that I, do, uh, that I write is that we do not receive any input. And uh, these digital platforms, these citizen journalism platforms are now becoming the major source of information. Even the, even the established media has been uh, following these networks. However, there is a little problem of verification. And last year uh, we have translated the verification handbook from English to Turkish. Currently it exists in Portuguese, English and Turkish uh, all around the world. It's uh, from the some journalism platform in the Netherlands, and we have been circulating this book all around. And uh, the citizen journalism platforms that I have sp uh, spoken about earlier, especially the Dokusikis Media and 140 Journals, they have picked up on this, and they give uh, trainings across the country. They uh, they start. Uh, can, you, can you briefly describe who they are? The Dokusikis Media. Uh, it was founded by, maybe you have seen, during the Gezi Park protests, there was uh, Gökhan Bicici, who was beaten and was being carried away by four riot police. He was a photojournalist for Evrensel, a very critical socialist media, and uh, he, I, I can't remember if he resigned from his job or if he lost his job. Somehow he started a media platform and called it Dokusekis, which, is, uh, which means 9-8, which is the rhythmic sound of uh, the drum uh, among the Roma communities. And uh, they have started uh, citizen journalism trainings across the country. So now they have thousands of people who are both readers and writers for Dokusekis Media. And 140 journals started as a student initiative, as uh, a group of students who are studying journalism 
they have started their initiative and uh, they wanted to be the ones to uh, spread the news. And later on it has uh, started growing, especially in university networks, and they have been growing and growing over the years. And particular impostuses started as uh, the hunger strike post, which uh, was to give daily news about the hunger strike uh, movement in the Turkish prisons. And each day they would share news, pictures and uh, writings from the prison. And later on they started uh, distributing different kinds of news as well and started relying too much on the citizen journalism. So they have become a citizen journalism platform. And the Voluntary Journalist Network, it has been founded by journalists who are working for uh, established media organizations. But if they get to be shushed down, if they are not allowed to publish, uh, publish a piece of news, they pass it to Voluntary ne Journalist Network without a name, and it gets published as anonymously. And I think that's a brilliant idea to uh, circumvent censorship. And these kind of initiatives have been our way to circumvent censorship in Turkey, actually. A few years ago, uh, the government has uh, tried to update one of the censorship bills. Actually, there is this 5651 censorship bill. We call it censorship bill, but it is the Internet Re Publications Regulation. When they wanted to update this bill, we tried to, uh, the, as the activists of digital rights and liberties, we tried to criticize this and we tried to bring it up to the national agenda so that it gets to be discussed and debated in the society and eventually, hopefully, it would be turned down by the parliament. But the media did not pick up on it. No matter how much we tried, we couldn't get any media coverage. So uh, I had suggested a brilliant tool that we would write something in English and distribute all around. All the foreign journalists in Istanbul and all our European networks. So we, we prepared a one-page report and then started sending it all around. And uh, I guess, Pitta, you had received one as well. Mm -hmm. And in the following week, we had, uh, as the group of uh, digital rights and liberties activists, in one week we have given 28 interviews to journalists from all countries and we had media coverage from 20 countries, I guess. And it kept growing over, uh, more and more in the coming weeks. And only then the Turkish media started referring to the situation, saying the European media claims that there might be traces of some kind of uh, restrictions on publications in the new updated bill. Not even calling it direct censorship, because this bill would allow uh, the government to shut down any media organization if they were being suspicious of any kind of criminal activity which being, of course, uh, publication of news. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I find it contradictory sometimes when you speak about media in Turkey that there is actually such a, as a, it's a, it's a vital media landscape. There are, and as, as Gürkan is a living example of, there are many initiatives to, to, to try to find kind of ways around the mainstream uh, media uh, landscape. Uh, is there anyone who wants to add something or should we move on to questions? Well, I, I could add just uh, one thing. Uh, uh, Turkish, the, the positive de development in Turkey changed so quickly, and it's we, it's it can happen anywhere. Actually, we have uh, the right-wing party in the Swedish Parliament, Sweden Democrats. They keep talking about Hungary as a role model for the media system. So it could happen here as well. So mm, we. How is it that People say I'm ridiculous when I say this, but, but I, I think we should con consider this a threat. Wait until the next election. Yeah. Mm. How is it for the, for the uni unions, for example? Are there any criteria? Have there been cases where, we're like, so to say, people are so, have such a different understanding of what journalism is that they couldn't agree? Does anyone know what well, happens in Sweden? Well, not professional journalists, I would say, but there's this alternative media, uh, the, the right-wing uh, net media, that keeps saying that it's the, 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 the political correct media, meaning professional media, is, is lying or withholding the truth. So, there, so you have this, at least. But we have, we have this in common, uh, I think, with, with the other countries like Turkey, uh, because of the, of the digital... Evolution or revolution. Yeah. 
the journalism aspect in the Turkish case, yes, it can happen in Sweden too. It can happen anywhere. No one is under absolute guarantee that it will never happen. The present day big uh, news owners or news media owners, the big uh, businessmen in Turkey, they were the ones who were marginal. They were the alternative media in early 90s. They were being ridiculed, they were being taken lightly. No one expected them to be such a big threat. And even uh, a lot of mainstream uh, people have been saying, oh, let them just play in the corner. But it can happen. And it usually happens in the absence of a proper opposition that is uh, unable to propose a better alternative to things. Thank you so if much. they flourish, this means uh, the others are not doing their job. <laughs> and something to think. Some food for thought for politicians. Uh, let's move on to questions, Q&As. Uh, let's start with Mohamed. Yes. Yeah, uh, hi, my name is uh, Mohamed Absel, I'm from Syria. Uh, I was living in Istanbul like two years ago. And I have a comment and a question. My comment is when I was in Istanbul, I worked with the Syrian opposition in Istanbul as a media director. And it was only for a few months. Uh, just for, for you to imagine how the journalism under fire in Turkey is not for Turkish journalists, but also for Syrian independent journalists. There was cases of uh, anonymous killing for journalists and shutting some uh, like um, what do you call it, like alternative uh, media uh, websites that were uh, operating from Turkey uh, in the media office in the uh, opposition uh, coalition in Turkey we had um, what well, they call it a bodyguard but he was much more than that was following the, the head of the office like all his meeting, all his... Uh, so he was being followed? Well, uh, they said for his own personal safety, but basically he was a witness on every single thing he did. And actually, uh, just um, two months ago, uh, two journalists from uh, a, a citizen journalism platform called uh, Raqqa is being slaughtered silently, which is uh, a media um, that is operating from inside Raqqa against ISIS, has been killed in... Um, uh, they were found in Turkey in Gaz, no? No, not, not in Gaz, in Urfa. Uh, Urfa, yes, yes. Yes. Right. yes. And they were known that they are not that much pro uh, Muslim Brotherhood. So, yes, it's not, unfortunately, it's not about the Turks, it's about everyone who is not agreeing with Erdogan. My question is, uh, and this is from my own observation, what AKP uh, media is doing in, in the MENA region is changing the narrative of what's happening in Turkey. So, listening to you and remembering how the media of pro-Erdogan in the Middle East is picturing Erdogan as, you know, the next sultan of the, the Islamic world, as the salvation of Muslims all over, and making the, 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 the Arabs looking to Turkey as their own modern democracy, like, this is our democracy, it's not the US or the West democracy. And it's like for, for the people who are living in this region, there is only one narrative and one voice coming out of Turkey. So, for example, when I write or talk about what is really happening in Turkey, I would be you know, a traitor who is pro those uh, uh, traitors, leftists, uh, who doesn't want Turkey to flourish. Uh, what do you think that... Um, or what are you doing to counter this narrative? What are you doing to reach out for people in the region to seek like regional solidarity for your story? Um, this is a very good, tough question. Really. <laughs> and then I, while you were asking, actually, I started questioning myself. What am, what am I actually doing for <laughs> breaking this narrative uh, to present something? I think I personally, or we as a group of alternative journalists in Turkey have been caught up 
in such a stressful moment that we are unable to think anything outside of the borders. I have realized in the last three years especially that I'm following the international news a bit less and more and more focusing on uh, what is happening on my street, what, uh, what is happening in my city and then what is happening in my region and the country. And even then I'm unable to get uh, factual information from some cities and that is a big problem. But uh, when it comes to breaking the international uh, narrative of uh, the Turkish government, yes, they do a lot of international outreach. And very often, interestingly, I meet people from uh, Turkey's immediate environment uh, where some people whom belongs to the same kind of circles that I do, and then they come and they give me a eulogy of Erdogan. They say, oh, he's our savior, he's our best option, he's going to be the wonderful leader that we have been in need of for a long time. This, uh, this kind of comments come from Kosovo, or Bulgaria, or Qatar, or United Arab Emirates, or Tun Tunisia, and I get surprised. Because, to me, it shows lack of information, to begin with, and when I counter uh, this kind of narrative, usually what I hear is, but you don't know him. He's the, he's the good guy. The other ones are the puppets of the West. That is, that is a very interesting approach because uh, this is usually coming from people who have always felt like their lives do not belong to them, that uh, the lines are being drawn by someone else and they are only allowed to operate within these lines. And it is very interesting that they have been copying this narrative uh, all the time. But no matter how much I have been trying to tell them that they should be the ones to decide for themselves, regardless of any leader, just individually, to think for themselves and have an opinion uh, individually, then some of them uh, agree and continue, and then some others say that I'm a lunatic and uh, should be locked up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have a, also a comment I'd like to fit into what you're saying here, and then I have a question. Uh, because I, I think that the general trend now worldwide, it, it's going authoritarian in the media. I mean, Al Jazeera is the world's best finance media company, and Russia today is growing, and China's television is growing. <laughs> Turkism is really growing by its TRT tradition, so, and it's going authoritarian. And I, as a comment to what you said, when I covered one of the elections in, in Turkey, I mean, the one in June, when AKP only got 40%, as I came back to Stockholm, the taxi driver who was from North Africa said, oh, I'm so sad that Erdogan lost this election. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I'm kind of happy. <laughs> and if this is how the narrative goes in here. And this is why my question comes here. Uh, I mean, the idea of self-regulation, it's fine. It works perfectly well within the Swedish Freedom of Press Act and so. But when you have a, a, an authoritarian country like Turkey, first you have the laws, and then you have the, 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 the courts for serving the interests of the government, and then you have the big big corporate interests are also serving the interests of the governments because they want the tenders. I mean, how much can you do with self-regulation? I think it's support of the digital media, the, the citizen journalism, and what you have at Bilge University Corporation with Dokusekis, and I've seen that. But I don't think that the self-regulation system can do so much within this scope authoritarian scope? Uh, uh, what I mean with uh, self-regulation is more the professional common discussions together uh, to support each other and uh, discuss. Uh, I think that is important. But, mm -hmm. but what you say about the digital uh, possibilities, uh, of course, that is much of the, of the outlet for information and journalism in the future. But that is also a way of coming away, making a, a long distance between the power and, and the media. So, so if, if I may put this, the, the question about self-regulation, if, if I should take anything from the Swedish system, I think that is what you should support or, or encourage uh, to empower the journalist with that. But on the other hand, I think uh, the situation in Sweden is not ideal, I would say. Although we have 
uh, Freedom of Expression Act, that is not enough. Uh, I mean, what I, I mentioned, the PR, for example, uh, I mean, uh, disinformation on the media, the lack of money, uh, which really minimize the possibilities for, for us to do qualitative journalism. I think we have very much in common. And, and what I think is one important thing for us is, as I said in the beginning, the coverage of, of for example, Turkey. Uh, and to support our colleagues there with, with journalism uh, together and project uh, together when you can exchange so much uh, the digital way. We have one question down. Can you present yourself as well? Uh, yeah, my name is Sarah Westerberg. I, I work for the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. Um, I was hoping to have a bit more of a kind of a historical perspective on um, seeing that we've got this situation now. Has it gradually got worse since 2002, or is it, you know, is it a kind of up and down uh, scenario? How how would you place it? Uh, historically, that the situation right now. Maybe first, and then swallow Turkey for nothing. Oh, well, I would say that there was a time, uh, quite recently, when when things were develop developing in a positive direction, um, but that was just for a short time, and now it's getting worse again. So, I would say that it has been. You must correct me if I am wrong, but but. Uh, some topics have always been touchy, uh, and I mean, um, uh, maybe leftist, maybe the Kurdish issue, and I think the Iranian issue as well. I'm, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm missing any, any issues, but these three were always a bit touchy. But I would say that I can't remember exactly what years, but quite recently there was a very positive development when it comes to press. That was 10 years ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 10 years ago. Uh, and also when it comes to, to... But it was connected to the pressure put on Turkey from the European Union, I would say. And, and since uh, Gezi Park or something, it's mm. changed. So, 2005 was the star of Turkish journalism, maybe. That in... Uh, in 2002... Yeah. <laughs> In 2002, this government came to power, and then they said, our focus is now Europe. We are going to improve everything to the European level, that it will be so good, they will have no chance of saying no to us. And they actually worked. They worked quite hard. They built up on uh, Kemal Darvish's uh, financial development plan, and they have started liberating Turkish society and Turkish state and all aspects of the country, in fact. They said, we have a solution for every problem of this country. So in 2003 and 2004, they worked hard. And in 2005, also in the graphics, it shows that Turkish uh, journalism was listed as best of its time in the last uh, 20 years. So that year, Turkey got a date for starting negotiations with the EU, and then the negotiations began. And then the first criticism... Uh, not first criticism, but uh, first harsh criticism began with the government as well. And from then onwards, it has been a downslide slowly. And since 2013, with the Gezi Park protests, it has been deteriorating so bad that Turkey has become an open, uh, open prison for journalists. So 10 years ago, there was a brief moment when things were seemingly pro uh, <laughs> progressing towards uh, good days, but uh, now again we are back to 1993. This is a matter of, of a, a lot of arguments, I think, of how to describe the, the development of this. Um, you have a question there? Yeah, Lars Gunnar Edmundsson is my name. Um, I've been in Turkey but it's long ago as a journalist. Uh, I want to ask you, Thomas, and some of you others who are um, working in Istanbul, uh, what are the possibilities for foreign correspondents? I, I know that there are more foreign correspondents now than it was 10, 20 years ago. Um, are there many limits for you? I usually answer this question with that I, I don't feel I have any limits at all, I have to say. I, I have had a 
press visa, official press visa now for, for four years. Uh, I go to the Turkish authorities to, to obtain my press visa and that's a bit of a bureaucratic process, but besides that, I've never felt that I have been a, had any limitations whatsoever. I felt I could work very freely. However, there are colleagues, and I would say that this has been a, a, an escalating problem recently, who had, who had, I mean, there are cases of deport, uh, deportations. Uh, there is one case now of an Iraqi journalist who worked for, for Vice News, who is still in prison in pre-trial uh, pre detentions. His name is Mohammed Rasul. Uh, he's being accused of being part of a, a terror organization, though there has been so far no real evidence for this, it seems. It seems as this is a hoax trial, because he was working for, for Vice News. Um, but personally, I've, I've, I haven't felt that I have limitations like that, that, I, that my work is, is limited somehow. I mean, the, the biggest problem, I would say, for me is that I don't get access to the government voices. I try to, to talk to them and ask them critical questions, but it's a, it's a wall. It's, you know, it's... It's on their terms. When they want to speak with, with you, then they speak with you. But otherwise, it's difficult to get access to them. But don't I, worry, I also don't get access to them. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing special for foreign. We don't say it's personal, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that makes me feel much better. <laughs> Natalie? Yeah, um, I don't really want to ruin the mood, but I think maybe there's an element of conceit um, um, in the discussion in that I think if the corresponding seminar were to be held in Turkey, it would be difficult for the moderator to bring that many newspapers, and that many newspapers with such different outlooks from Sweden with them to Turkey. So I'm interested in Aisha Gürs and uh, Gürkan's impression of Swedish media and plurality of um, opinion and, and the number of media outlets that we have access to here. What's your impression, if any? Um, I can start. <laughs> I, I'm not an expert on journalism and I don't have much idea of what was going on in Sweden, but I know that. We know that as Ari and Rak together. Um, we know that Sweden is a country that we should benchmark ourselves because the ethical issues is handled in the good hands and uh, that's why we were together with Rak. We came together with Rak. And, um, I think uh, that's why we're here. <laughs> well, means Svenska är inte så bra. So, uh, my observation of Swedish media is not so great. But uh, I'm grateful for Google Translate. <laughs> and I try to follow uh, the Swedish news as much as possible, uh, as much as I can see. But I must say that there are also problems in Sweden, and uh, at a different level, at a different magnitude. Nothing like uh, in Turkey, but uh, also uh, it is possible to see problems in Swedish media as well. And uh, the PRization of media especially is visible. So, as I, unfortunately, I cannot say much about Swedish media, uh, not being able to read most of it. <laughs> I would like to add something. Um, I'm glad, you know, so many people from media are here today to discuss this issue with us. So this is an impression of myself, uh, something positive about Swedish media right now. Mm -hmm. Because you're here to listen to us and whatever we want to say, we can say openly and discuss together. And uh, this is what we are supposed to do uh, as part of this project, the EU uh, civil society dialogue, to improve the dialogue between journalists and between societies. We think we have a last question here. It's like uh, he wants to look for it. Okay, with Marie and then and then you. Uh, I would just like to go back to the first question, actually, which is a bit why there's so little collaboration between Turkish civil rights movement and this type of journalism, and the one that already exists in the Arab world. In your neighbours, you have a lot of examples who've been fighting the same problems you now have to deal with. But it seems to me like the more democratical media, the citizen journalists, they always turn to us in Europe. We don't really know how to deal with these problems, guys. And, I mean, it's a different situation. And you have, like, just on the other side of the border, you have a lot of people with a lot of experience. I mean, when I was in Turkey myself, I will have contact with a lot of Syrians, for example, in Turkey, working with outlets. 
and Turkish people I know will not have the same kind of contact lens. Why do you think this is? I think as a nation we have been looking towards Europe for, for too long a time. Mm. And Erdogan was the first one to break that prejudice actually. He said there exists a different world, not just Europe. That there is Caucasus, there is Iran, there is the Middle East, and there is Northern Africa. There is a whole continent of Africa. In that aspect, I'm grateful to him as well, because he opened up our minds to different possibilities. But Turkey is still at a learning process. Previously, I cannot really uh, think of those times. Of course, I was still too little, but uh, early 90s, I don't think most of the Turkish people from the newspapers or from other media, they would not even see any citizen initiatives from the Middle East. We would only see the Middle East as a piece of news where there has happened clashes or bombs or any kind of violent activities. It was just like a third page uh, news that it would only appear if there is any kind of uh, violence going on or if there is something in Palestine that is even very rarely, but uh, most of the international outreach from Turkey would be towards Europe, and that is changing. Turkey is now discovering again the neighbors and regions that are not Europe, but uh, other parts of the world, and even now the international news, even though it is very limited in the Turkish context, mostly is dedicated towards Europe, but it is becoming more and more variable. But don't you think you've kind of gotten a little bit behind because you have Muslim Brotherhood, for example, who is very good in dealing with your neighboring countries, and then you have like the more democratic side of you not dealing with these guys who you could really collaborate with and learn from and share your experiences? It is just starting. You have more of these kind of panels <laughs> Mm -hmm. Just across the border, will we see more of these things? I think the first time I personally participated in a collaborative uh, training program with uh, Middle Eastern and Northern African activists and journalists was in 2008 or 2009. That was, the, that was my first uh, interaction with uh, an Arab intellectual or Arab journalist or someone from Arabic countries, but my first interaction with a European uh, counterpart was in 1997, I think. So the availability also decides a bit that previously it did not uh, seem very possible because there were not tools and there were not paths that were available. But currently, as you put it, uh, there is more chances at the moment. And I guess there is going to be even more. And one of the reasons why, uh, with the Europeans, there has been more interaction, there has been more uh, will, was the cross-border projects by the EU. In the 90s, Turkey has had uh, several cross-border projects, and me, coming from a bordering town to Bulgaria, even as a teenager, I was able to participate in these cross-border events when we would receive international guests or we would uh, send international uh, guests to other countries. But with the Arab world, there has not existed such a tool before. So maybe. With the visa liberalization, actually, it was becoming almost possible in 2010. But then again, there started the war. Jonathan. Yes. Um, alternative media and citizen journalism is something that is growing in, in most countries around the world. I mean, reporters brought borders can see this all the time. We've actually moved. We're actually moving away from the term journalists and going into calling it uh, news providers because so many of, of the individuals who are providing most crucial information are not uh, trained journalists in the, in the traditional sense. Um, my question is, is I mean, is, is, do, do you know of any, uh, because again, drawing the parallel to the Swedish alternative media, it it's wouldn't hardly would be hard to describe the Swedish alternative media as a pinnacle of media ethics. I think. Yes. Um, so there's also a, 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 a flip side to the coin of alternative media. Do you work systematically or know of any uh, tools of, of, of uh, dealing with with uh, citizen journalism and ethical questions, or 
or are we still in uptime projects, for example? Is, is that only dealing with traditional journalists and forgetting about this hugely important um, uh, uh, section of, of the new, new journalism? Actually, when we go back to the start of the project, it was more on print media, to tell you the truth. But uh, when you open up the subject, it is going towards citizen journalism and digital journalism, of course. So it should be going that way. Mm -hmm. So we start doing uh, things, uh, seminars like this, and we start talking about digital journalism. And the pathway is through digital journalism, of course. It's, a, it's an alternative to print media. But basically, it was print media. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, and these journals and platforms that you were talking about, do, do, do they deal with ethical questions? Yes, uh, very briefly, yes, and that it, this is how they do this. I have already been talking about the brilliant journalism professors in Turkey. They are such wonderful people. They dedicate a lot of their time to uh, NGOs, civil society and initiatives, and they volunteer in giving such trainings. So they travel with the citizen journalism platforms to different cities across the country. This mainly takes place through university networks. They get a room for two, three days, and then they give uh, certain trainings on ethical journalism, verification processes, and uh, there are many uh, workshops taking place. Of course, this is never enough. It is not enough. It is never going to be enough. But uh, there is a will, and they are doing more things. And I hope that this will actually catch up and uh, keep spreading, because now, even if we are not training uh, news providers or citizen journalists, we are at least uh, training media literacy. So these people, even if they never will write anything, even if they will never ever uh, submit any publication, they will at least know what to look for in uh, a news piece, in an article. I think Kerstin wanted to add. Uh, I, I just want to comment on what you said that uh, that uh, the most important I think for for citizen journalists is to be critical on the sources, the different sources, and that I think it's such an important ethical matter. But the, the comment you had about uh, why our Turkish uh, colleagues are here instead of somewhere else, I think it's very much to the point. It it's such an important remark. And uh, the only thing I can uh, 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 say about this is that it's uh, good for us that our colleagues are here to <laughs> learn us about it. Really. Very good. Mohammed? Uh, a very small comment about uh, why there is no uh, almost, there is no almost uh, cooperation between, uh, uh, let's say, Turks and Syrians. Uh, unfortunately, there is this kind of uh, monopoly. Uh, on both sides, so uh, for 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 um, for the Turks, and uh, I met some activists when I was in Istanbul. Uh, how Syrians are portrayed, they are Erdogan's people, and how uh, like people who are against Erdogan, journalists and activists are portrayed for Syrians, they are the ones who want to kick Syrians out, and unfortunately, these two narratives are not true. It's just portrayed like this, so we don't meet and cooperate. Mm -hmm. And for example, when I was in, in the media office, one of the things that I, I worked a lot to do, uh, but I faced like this big no, with, was to connect with uh, citizen journalists in, 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 in Turkey. And it was like no, without even like a possibility for okay. discussion. Yeah, mm -hmm. but like no. They didn't want cooperation. No, 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 no. no. Like, who stopped it? The, the management of the media office. Because they know that uh, if this happened, we will be kicked out of Turkey as opposition. So uh, I believe that this kind of cooperation should break these stereotypes and should break this monopoly on both sides because at, like, at the end we are facing the same struggle. Uh, so. I think this is an interesting observation of that. I mean, the political fault lines in Syria and Turkey is more translatable, <laughs> I guess, than in with Europe, for example. Yeah. You have yes. sim and that that kind of tension is mm -hmm. translating them yeah. into each other. Uh, any other yeah, questions? Yeah. Toss. 
uh, picking up on what you asked before, um, um, how is uh, this media concentration of, of Erdogan's uh, party being reflected in among Turks? I mean, are they sort of believing in what they're saying or are they skeptical to it? Are they like the Russians buying Putin media also in Turkey? I would say not a very big part of the society believes in uh, all this, but the media is a very interesting thing because the more it repeats something, the more people tend to believe. Mm. And uh, this repetition causes a kind of discrepancy in the minds of the citizens. However, then again, a big majority in the country is able to filter these kind of things. In certain cases, it is at such an exaggerated level that it is impossible to believe. For example, during Gezi, there was the case, uh, the, the Gezi Park protest, there was the case on the second day, they claimed uh, that the daughter of one of the chief editors of this pro-government uh, newspaper has been assaulted by 50 half-naked men in the middle of the most central part of Istanbul, and then the whole sexual fantasy unravels. And it is so unbelievable that almost no one believes in this, but the group that believes in it uh, is a fanatical believer and they will take action. However, there is another big percentage in the country that benefits uh, from this uh, relationship uh, with the government. So it is a mutually beneficial relationship they have with the government. So they, even though they do not believe, they claim to believe. So they will propagate for this cause. But I would say the majority of the people does not even trust media anymore. Okay. We don't have any more questions. I guess it's time to, to round up. Should we say something positive to end on a, a good note? Yeah. I know it's been a lot of... of there is always hope. <laughs> there is always hope. Thank you, Lucan. Thank, thank you so much, all of you, for, for coming in the panel. And thank you, the audience, for coming here. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for coming. Um, Reporters Without Borders, we publish a photo magazine quarterly. And this will be our humble gift to our uh, participants of the panel. Thank you very much for, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.